Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. My name is Nathan Parikh. Uh, I'm blessed to serve as the discipleship pastor here at Hallmark. If you're new, our amazing pastor and his wife, Joy, would love to meet you right after the service here in the lobby. I'm thankful to have this opportunity this morning to open God's Word together. So if you would, take your Bibles and open with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 21 is where we will spend the bulk of our time this morning. And as you turn there, I want you to think about expectations. All of us have expectations. Uh, now, the issue comes when our expectations don't match with reality, right? Uh, there's the common uh, like meme format online where it's expectations versus reality. Uh, for example, here you have one, you're expecting a nice, hot, delicious pepperoni pizza. Everything looks normal. Everything looks good about that pizza, but then you open it up. It's <laughs> technically a pepperoni pizza, but not quite as much pepperoni as you would have expected, right? Uh, or maybe you like to bake, you have experienced some Pinterest inspirations. Here's a beautifully themed Christmas cupcake, uh, wonderful looking thing. I don't know what you call this, but then you try it out and <laughs> not quite the same effect. Or you make a booking on Airbnb, it says there's a private balcony view, but they don't tell you it's right up against the concrete of the next building over, right? Sometimes we have expectations, and those expectations don't match with reality. And those are funny, but it can cause conflict in a lot of relationships, right? Especially in marriage. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced unmet expectations, who's doing what chores, what, what, what's the parenting style going to be, what's the, commu what's the communication styles. I'm sure none of you have ever experienced anything like that before, probably just me and my wife. But differences of expectations cause conflict. And I want you to kind of keep that in mind as we turn to Matthew chapter 21. This is probably one of the most classic Palm Sunday passages. I want you to think about the expectations that the people of Israel had for the Messiah. The expectations that they had for Jesus as he makes his triumphant entry. Most of you in your Bibles probably have that heading over Matthew 21, says the triumphant entry. And while that's true, I want, to ask, I want you to ask yourself, how is it that Jesus here on this Sunday is marching into Jerusalem, the capital city of God's chosen people, surrounded by praises and adoration and thanksgiving and excitement and just five days later he would be killed how is it that the crowds that are thronging him with praise right now some of them very soon will be the same people shouting for him to be brutally killed what was is the disconnect what can so dramatically happen in the span of five days that would cause this to happen I think a big part of it is that their expectations did not match the reality of God's kingdom. Their expectations for what God should do and how God should work did not match the reality of what he had planned for his people. And so to better put ourselves in their shoes to understand that, I just wanna go over a few quick things with you just to give you some cultural context for what's going on in Matthew chapter 21. First of all, this is the beginning of Passover week, right? This is the most exciting, most holy festival on the Jewish calendar, right? They're looking back to the book of Exodus, to the time of the Exodus when they were slaves in Egypt, and they were desperately in need of salvation. They were slaves for 400 years, and finally God shows up, and he delivers them from that slavery. He sets them free, and they are able to then travel to the Holy Land. This was the main theme of this week, this national freedom, much like we would celebrate the 4th of July a time of national freedom. That's what the whole vibe was in Jerusalem and Israel during this time of year. They were celebrating the fact that God had set them free. So this is what they were looking for, right? Again, also, that kind of sets the stage. This Passover week in Matthew 21 happens about 1,400 years after the first one. And so Jesus arrives in Jerusalem 1,400 years later, Knowing, though, what we know, having read scripture, that God did not deliver his people in the book of Exodus with conventional means, right? The human thought would have been in Exodus, if I'm going to be delivered from slavery, we need a mighty army. We need a mighty military. We need a mighty political leader to rise up and revolt and take the charge against Pharaoh 
And instead, what does God do? He does everything opposite, different, beyond what any of their expectations would have been. And it's in that context that Jesus marches into Jerusalem here. Also think about the political state of Israel during this time. They are not free. For the last hundred years at this point, they had been under the domination of Rome. And Rome was not known for being kind to its subjects. And so they were tired of living under Caesar. They were tired of living that type of life. And so who were they looking for? They're looking for a political savior. They're looking for someone who can come and say, we don't want to be under Rome anymore. We want to go back to the old glory days of David and Solomon when Israel was the superpower, when Israel was the place to be. We don't want to be subject to Rome and to Caesar and all of their laws. They were looking for a son of David to come in and take the throne of Israel. And then just a few weeks, a few days before this happened as well, just a couple of miles away, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. You know, up until this point, this is three years into the ministry of Jesus, and over time, all of this anticipation and excitement was building. After every miracle that he did that fulfilled the messianic prophecies, people were getting more and more excited. And now, right before Passover, Jesus raises a man from the dead. And people are like, man, this is it. This is the Messiah. This is the guy that we are looking for. He's going to come in, and he's going to set us free from the oppression of Rome. He has the power to do it. This was their expectation. But we'll see it's not going to line up with the reality of God's kingdom. And so in today's message called The Way of the King, we will see that the way of the king upends worldly expectations. The way of the king upends worldly expectations. So first of all, the way of the king declares salvation. Let's look at Matthew 21, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem... And came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. So Jesus, he's pretty much walked his whole ministry. So why now does he choose to ride a donkey into Jerusalem? Why does he pick that animal? This is an important symbol that communicates his purpose. Uh, in in uh, verse 5, he's saying, yes, I am a king, But what type of king am I going to be? I'm going to be a humble king. He did not ride a war horse into Jerusalem to to declare his political dominance over Rome. Instead, he mimics Solomon in, in the book of 1 Kings. Solomon, on his coronation day, rides a donkey in a time of peace into the Jerusalem capital to take his place as king. And so how is verse 5, what does it say about this king? Behold, your king is coming to you, humble mounted on a donkey. That's the type of king Jesus came to be. Again, is that the type of king that most people look for? We don't want someone who's humble, someone who's meek, someone who is kind. We want someone who's going to get the job done, no matter what that means about who they are, right? And that's who the people of Israel were looking to as well. And so Jesus here, he's coming here. He says, I'm not here to declare political revolution. I'm here to declare that I am humble and I bring salvation. Again, they were, they were focused on the here and now. They were focused on the temporary and on the physical. Jesus is focused on the spiritual. So this is the humble procession of a humble Savior. Now the prophet that is referenced here in the book of Matthew is the prophet Zechariah. Uh, the prophet Zechariah, you might want to write this passage down. Zechariah 9 is very, uh, a big, very much a big part of this procession during Palm Sunday. And in chapter 9, verse 9, he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea. So we see here that this Messiah... He is bringing salvation, and he is bringing peace. That is the purpose for which Jesus came. 
Now, the expectations of the people was war, fight against the Romans. But the reality of the way of the king was to speak peace, to bring salvation. And again, this peace is deeper than a political ceasefire. The peace that Jesus seeks to bring is more fundamental than that. It's peace between us as sinners and a righteous God. See, we as people, we deserve God's wrath and God's judgment. And God says by nature we are at odds. We are at enmity. We are against, we are enemies of God. And so Jesus, recognizing that problem, that's the whole purpose for which he came, was to be able to bring peace between man and between God so that we can have salvation, so we can know that we are God's children. And then on top of this, who is he coming to save? In verse 10 of Zechariah 9, he says, He shall speak peace to the nations. This isn't an Israel thing. This isn't an exclusive offer for the Jews. This is something for all mankind, all people, all nations. And he can save the nations because his kingship is global. right? He would bring salvation not just to the chosen Jewish people. He would bring salvation to all of us. People that were not originally a part of the nation of Israel. Now God has extended the offer of salvation to everyone. So that is our mission today. Our mission is to speak a message of peace and a message of salvation. Right? There are a lot of issues in this world today. There's a lot of brokenness in our world today. What is the answer? Is it a stronger economy? Is it a better political leadership? Or is it the good news of Jesus Christ? We as believers, we know it's the good news of Jesus, right? I hope. But how do we act? How do we live? What are we communicating to those around us? Have we shared more about our political opinions, about how to fix what's happening today, then we have shared the gospel. Because the gospel is the root of the issue. The gospel is the heart of why Christ came to save us. So the way of the king declares salvation. And because that salvation is spiritual at the heart level, the way of the king, secondly, rejects political power. Look at verse 7 of Matthew chapter 21. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now this word Hosanna is important. It was a declaration of praise that was commonly used during their worship services during Jewish festivals. It was always used in reference to God. And the, the word Hosanna means save now. Save us now. Save us, we beseech you. The, the whole concept of, of Hosanna is that we need to be saved. Now again, what's, what's the disconnect between the people of Israel saying this and what Jesus came to offer? They were saying, Hosanna, save us now. Save us from the Romans. Save us from oppression. Save us from our circumstances. And Jesus said, no, I, I came to save you from yourself. I came to save you from your sins. And as they waved those palm branches, at that time, palm branches were a symbol of Jewish nationalism, right? That was, if you look back at some of their ancient coins, you would see palm branches were a very common feature on Jewish coins. It was just a symbol for their nation. So no doubt, all of the disciples are, during this moment, caught up as well, shouting, Hosanna. But this is what they've been waiting for. They've been following Jesus for three years. You know who else is probably shouting Hosanna at this moment is, is Judas, but only a few days from now, Judas is going to betray Jesus. In all the gospel accounts, Judas goes to the chief priest to, to betray Jesus after Palm Sunday. He too was looking for a political savior. He too was looking for someone that would right all of the political wrongs in the world. And when Jesus did not do that, when his expectations were not met, he says, you know what? I went out. I'm done. So the problem is, that people thought that the issue was Rome. But Jesus arrives and tells them, no, the issue is in your heart. The problem is not that they were poor financially. The problem, Jesus said, it was that they were not poor in spirit. The problem was not they were not strong enough. The problem, Jesus said, is that they were not meek enough. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. See, they didn't know as they shouted for Jesus to, to save them, to save their city, that only 40 years from now, Rome would come and totally destroy 
the entire thing. They would tear down the temple. They would tear down the walls of Jerusalem. The very thing that they wanted Jesus to save. And Jesus told them that this was going to happen. And yet, even though Jerusalem would be destroyed, God's kingdom keeps moving forward. Why? Because it's not a here and now physical manifestation of his kingdom yet. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a kingdom of people's hearts. And that's what Jesus is interested in conquering. He's not interested in conquering the lands of the earth yet. Right now, his primary mission is to conquer the hearts of men and women. His primary mission is that we share the gospel with people who are stuck and lost in their sin and say, hey, we know a king, we know a savior, we know a way out if you just follow him. That's the message, that's the heart of the gospel. So let's focus on that part of the way. So this is the way for us now as a church and as the church in America. You know, wielding political power has not been and will not be the answer for the American church or any church. Beating the opposite political party is not the answer. The way forward for the church in America is not an external revolution, but an internal revolution, what we like to call revival. What we like to call God doing something radical within us and drawing people to himself when we embrace the heart of God, when we follow in lockstep in the way of the king. And that's what we as a church are trying to encapsulate with our four core values, to be biblically driven, to be personally involved, to be radically generous, and to be outwardly focused. We're trying to encapsulate what it looks like to follow the way of the king in 2023. We're trying to follow Jesus and help bring others along in that journey so that they too can find that hope and salvation that so many of us have benefited from. You know, during this time, while the crowd is shouting Hosanna to Jesus, there was another man in Jerusalem. He had also attempted to establish a new rule for Israel. In the book of Mark, it calls him a murderer. His name is Barabbas. Now, if you grew up in church and you saw pictures of Barabbas as a kid, he's always drawn as this really mean, ugly-looking guy with a scowl on his face. He's like the most obvious bad guy ever. But I have a feeling, just maybe, and maybe that was the case, who knows, but I have a feeling that just maybe Barabbas was a guy that many of us if we were in the people's shoes of Israel, we would, have, we would have looked up to them. We would have looked up to Barabbas. He was a freedom fighter. He was taking the fight to the Romans. He was, maybe his methods weren't the best, right? But he was hitting them where it hurts. He was trying to move the ball forward. He was trying to establish something real for the people of Israel. And so, yes, we, we know that Barabbas was a bad guy. But maybe we should cut the people of Israel a little bit of slack. If we had been there in their shoes, if we had been oppressed for 100 years by Rome, we just might like Barabbas. And he's sitting there in his prison cell waiting also to be crucified. And so on Friday, when the people of Israel are given the choice, whose way do you want to follow? The way of political revolution or the way of the king? What do they pick? They pick political revolution. They said, we don't like what Jesus is talking about. I don't want to worry about me. I don't want to worry about my internal, the internal state of my heart. I don't want to act like I'm the problem. Rome's the problem. Our circumstances are the problem. We need someone to come in and clean all this mess up. And if Jesus won't do it, and if Barabbas will at least try, then we're going to go with him. And that's what happened on that Friday. The way of the king leads to revolution, but it's always going to be internal instead of external. The way of the king does not lead to political victory, the way of the king leads to a cross. Again, this whole process for the expectations of the people of Israel was mind-blowing. In no concept did they have that their Messiah would come and then be murdered five days later. That was not part of their plan. They thought the Messiah will ride in and establish his kingdom on earth and everything will be great. And instead, Jesus rides in and says, yeah, I'm not here to upend Rome. I'm here to upend you. They're like, yeah, we don't really want that. Because as we'll see here, the way of the king demands cleansing. Look at verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple, and he drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. 
but you have made it a den of robbers. The way of the king leads to cleansing of his people before it leads to victory over his enemies. God wants to cleanse you and me before he takes care of the problems of the world. The expectations of the Jews at this time, they would see themselves as good people. They are descendants of Abraham. They were in the promised land. God had promised all this amazing things to them, and they were waiting for that to happen. They didn't need any cleansing. It was the Romans that were dirty. They were the problem. They were polluting the Holy Land with their presence. And during this week, during the most holy week, during Passover, everyone's on their best behavior, right? Everyone's traveling to Jerusalem, to the capital city, to make sacrifices, to worship God. And what does Jesus do? He goes off. He walks into the temple during this amazing procession, and he sees how they are corrupting themselves. He sees how the pure worship of God has been changed, and he cannot let it stand. See, we have to remember that Jesus was a radical person. Was he humble? Absolutely. But he could not let sin just be. He would not let his people be stuck in sin and just sit idly by. So we want God to address the sin that's out there in the world. I think that's great, and we need to pray for that. But really, the first thing that needs to happen is God needs to address the sin in here and in here, in my heart. Again, that's what we call revival. We talk about revival in America like everyone else out there is going to get fixed. I think revival is when I get fixed, when you and I are made more into the image of Christ. That is what God is seeking to do in his church today. I firmly believe that. We want everything in the world to be made better, and hopefully it will. But God's primary goal for us as believers is that we are conformed into the image of Jesus. He does not promise us a comfortable, good, secure, safe life now. He never does. What he does promise us, though, is that in the midst of the highs and the lows of life, he will never leave us or forsake us. He promises us that in the good times and the bad times, he will use those things to mold us and to shape us into the image of his son, Jesus. So that when we finally do get to see him face to face, we will be complete. We will be made whole. That is God's primary agenda. But the problem here is that God's people were distracted. They were distracted by greed. We just had this series called The Material World, right? Talking about the tug and the pull of the here and now and how strong that pull can be in our hearts. And that is nothing new. Here we have people that were traveling to Jerusalem to worship God during Passover week. And you could not worship God empty-handed. You had to make a sacrifice. And so what did the religious leaders of Jerusalem do? Do they see this, oh man, we're so blessed, we're so thankful, so many people are coming to worship God? No, they, they saw this as a potential to make bank. People are traveling here from everywhere. They haven't brought anything. What are they going to do? They have to buy from us. Let's jack up the prices. This is our Black Friday, and we'll have a great time the rest of the year. That's how they were treating this moment. This was not a time of worship. This was a time of big money. And Jesus walks in. He sees this, and he's like, no, this is not going to happen. He, he calls them robbers. He calls them thieves. In the very place where God was to be praised and magnified and worshipped, instead, what does he find? He finds the worship of material possessions. And for us as Americans, for me, in this world, living in this world, with the hustle, with the grind, it's easy to get caught up in all of that. But God's mission for you and I, may God bless you with some great stuff, sure, that'd, that'd be great. But is that God's purpose for you? No. Is that God's ultimate desire for you? No. When you and I are, have been in a heaven for a million years, we're not going to care about what house we had or what car we drove. We are going to care about our walk with God. And that is God's heart for us, his heart for his people. And so what does God want us then? Like how can we keep, want for us then? How can we keep God at the center of our hearts? Well, Jesus here, he gives us the answer. He says, my house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. My house shall be called a house 
of prayer. That is what we need to be known for, to be a praying people. He tells us who he wants us to be. The king is telling us how he wants his subjects to act as we travel down the way of the king, as we go through this life, through, through the hard times, through the difficult times, through the scary times, and the successful times, God wants us to be a people of prayer. During this time of oppression, of political upheaval, um, th there's this desire to, for Israel to, to go back to their glory days, to have this political revolution. And Jesus says, no, I would rather you spend time with me. I would rather you let me do a work in your heart that no one else can do. Because whoever is Caesar can change, but they're not going to change your heart. Whoever is in Congress or in the White House can change, but that's not going to have any effect on your heart or on mine. Only God can do that. Only the gospel has that power. For, for cleansing, I, I just love this verse, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is nothing that we can't bring to God that he cannot address. There is no sin that is in your past or in your present that is too much for God to handle. And God wants you to bring that sin to him. And what, what will we find when we humbly bring our sins before the Father? We will find forgiveness. We will find mercy. We will find peace. But that is God's ultimate plan for us. Not the here and now, but peace between God and man. You know, much like the people in Israel's day, we as believers were looking forward to the king's return. We're looking forward to what God will do. And it's, it was hard for me to to not read this passage in the book of Matthew and think forward to the book of Revelation. And I hope that this gets you excited for the return of the king. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, then I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings." And Lord of Lords. In Matthew 21, Jesus enters Jerusalem humble, offering peace, offering salvation. But this day is coming when God will show up not on a donkey, but on a war horse from heaven. And we as his followers will be there with him. Except at that point, the time for salvation will be over. At that time, the time for peace will be over. We think of all the evils in the world. When will they be addressed? This is when they will be addressed. Christ will come back and he will make all things new. He will, bring, he will bring everlasting peace to you, to me, to this earth, if we are his followers. But right now, during this time, what is the mission? What is the hope? It is this message of salvation and peace that is offered to every single person on earth. In case, you, in case you haven't read the rest of the story, Jesus does win the final battle, right? Things work out in the end, but only if we are following him. The early Christians were not called Christians. They were called followers of the way. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The way of the king is the way of Jesus, you and I, as followers of Jesus, we are followers of the way. We're not followers of America. We're not followers of the political system of our day. We're not followers of whoever your favorite social media influencer is. We are followers of Christ. And that is what should shape how we think, how we live, how we act. And the fundamental way that shapes us is that we share the truth of the gospel with people here and now. So that when this day comes, they too can have hope they too can have salvation. If you would bow your heads with me as the, as the worship team comes up, that word Hosanna, when the people were crying, save us now, 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Jesus is not yet here on his war horse. He is here offering you and I peace with God. We need to stop pursuing the American dream and begin pursuing the way of the king. God is offering you and I amnesty from his just judgment. But what is the condition for that? The condition is that you and I turn away from our allegiance to self, from our allegiance to money, from our allegiance to our physical well-being and security and whatever else it is that we have loved more than Jesus. And instead we bow down in total submission and we, and we receive Christ as king. In the book of Isaiah 53, verse 5, we see the heart of this king for us. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. This is the way of the king. This is the way that you and I have the opportunity to follow today. If you're here this morning and you feel God tugging on your heart, if you know you have not been following the way of the king, you've been distracted by the things of this world, you've been following the things of this world, you have not loved Christ more than this world, then I would ask that when I'm done and the band starts singing, that you stand up and come to meet me right here at the front. And we will pray together. And you can know that you are saved. You can know that you are following the way of the king. And for my fellow believers, God's heart for us is a heart of cleansing. Ask God to revive you. Ask God to revive Hallmark. Ask God to do a work that only he can do. Ask God to adjust your expectations of him in this life, to give you an eternal perspective, an eternal mindset, to see the people around you every single day at work, at school, in your neighborhood, as souls for whom Christ died. And God has put you there for a purpose. God has put you there for a mission. But we cannot do it on our own strength. We cannot do it in our own power. And so I want to invite all of you. God has said he wants this to be a house of prayer. Let's come before him today and ask God to revive us.